Short news this week is Intel is introducing yet another version of its Turbo technology. What's your minimum specification? This new fourth version of Intel's Turbo is known as Adaptive Boost Technology. Or you may hear me refer to it as Floating Turbo because it's a turbo that floats. It will opportunistically try to raise the value of your frequency based on thermals, uh, thermal headroom, power headroom, to try and get the best frequency possible. Now, if that sounds similar, kind of like AMD's Precision Boost 2, then you're not far wrong. So let's go through Intel's turbo technologies one by one. If you go over to Anantech and read my news on this, you'll come to this page, Intel's new adaptive boost technology, Floating Turbo Comes to Rocket Lake. We go through Intel's frequency levels, and I'll go through them here with you. So first of all, we have the base frequency. Now, this is the frequency at which the processor is guaranteed to run at. This is where warranty conditions come in. And in general, the power consumption is no higher than the TDP rating of the processor. This is when you're not in a turbo mode. This is meant to be when you're in a sustained mode. Now, beyond that, you have Turbo Boost 2, which is usually called TB2, and it's the one we're most familiar with. Um, when you're inside a turbo mode, TB2 is essentially a lookup table of how many cores are active, so what's the frequency the CPU can run at. And with the turbo, there's a, usually a turbo budget that goes along with it. And while you're inside that turbo budget, you're in Turbo Boost 2 mode. When you're outside that budget, then you typically go down to base frequency and TDP values. Next up is Turbo Boost Max 3, or TBM3, also known as Favored Core. And these are typically regarded as the best performing cores on the chip for voltage and frequency. So with TBM3 in effect, when you have a workload that's typically one or two cores, the CPU or the OS can migrate that workload to those specific cores, and those cores will give you an extra 100 megahertz on top. Uh, just a little bit of extra turbo while you're still inside the turbo window. If you're outside the turbo window, then TBM3 doesn't activate. Next up is the newer one out of the list, is Thermal Velocity Boost. Now, this is a, some, it's like TBM3, but it applies across the whole processor and it gives you an extra 100 megahertz if your processor is below 70 degrees Celsius on the desktop. I believe it's slightly higher on notebooks. I think it's 75 degrees. But the idea is that if you have the thermal headroom, then you get some extra frequency. Now, Intel typically limits uh, thermal velocity boost to its highest processors when you're unlikely to be in that thermal window anyway. But it mostly applies, I think, in single core and dual core mode when you're just raising up one or two of those processors to get to that. Um, you'll be inside that thermal budget window, hopefully. Now, this new technology is called adaptive boost technology, or as like I said, floating turbo. And this means that when you're running three cores or more, the processor will try and hit the peak turbo boost two speeds of cores one and two. And so if you have a processor that is running at uh, 4.7 gigahertz, all core turbo, it will try to do 4.8 if there's thermal and power headroom. If it can do 4.8, it will do 4.9. If it can do 4.9, it will try five, all the way up to that uh, single and dual core turbo boost two limit. Um, so this is what I mean by floating. It is opportunistic. It isn't a fixed value, um, but your lower limit is your turbo boost two value and your upper limit is that single core turbo boost two value. What does this look like in a diagram? Well, this is why I've pulled up a Nantec because I've done a few diagrams here that I'd like to show with you. Um, so here we have the Core i7-11700K. This is the chip that I've already tested. It has Turbo Boost 2 values of uh, 4.9 gigahertz up to four cores, then down to 4.6 gigahertz with all eight cores. It also has Turbo Boost Max 3, and the two favored cores will boost up another 100 megahertz to five gigahertz. And that's fairly straightforward. There's no thermal velocity boost, and there's no, um, adaptive boost technology either. So thermal velocity boost comes in with the Core i9s and it looks very similar to the Core i7s except you have plus 100 megahertz on all the cores. Now whether anything from Core 3 onwards will actually activate depends on your cooling performance and depends on how well uh, your processor performs. Uh, you may have heard of the silicon lottery, not all cores are equal in terms of their voltage frequency response and this is essentially if you get a good sample if you get a good skew, then you will likely get thermal velocity boost at some level. Now, the only processes to get adaptive boost technology are the Core i9Ks and the Core i9KFs. 
So what we have here is you see thermal velocity boost kind of disappears beyond three cores, and you just have that adaptive boost technology at that 5.1 gigahertz. And so regardless of your core loading at three cores to eight cores, it will try and hit 5.1 gigahertz if the power and the thermals allow. As you can see, there's a quite a big difference compared to just the standard Core i9 non-Ks. Uh, this is a 65 watt processor, and this is you know 125 watt processor. There will be obviously a power difference between 4.7 gigahertz and 5.1 gigahertz. Uh, we'll have to test when the review for when the reviews come out. So one important thing to note is this wasn't part of the standard Rocket Lake launch materials. This came a couple of days after, which is a little bit weird. Um, and the BIOSes that I have. Um, adaptive boost technology are now rolling out. But one interesting thing to think about is that uh, this isn't actually a default setting. Default for this, for uh, adaptive boost technology, is disabled. Now this is a bit weird. You now we've already seen in reviews that these processors, um, the when they go full with full frequency for the full power, they start to draw a lot of power. But we've also seen that the Z590 motherboards have some pretty solid power delivery. I mean, they're starting at $175, which is a bit insane, given that it was only a few years ago that $175 bought you the best of the top-end chipset. What this means is we're going to see a lot more people going for the uh, B-series motherboards. Now, the, we're not sure if um, adaptive boost technology is for the Z-series only or whether the B-series will be included in that, but the B-series also have to cater for these Core i9s should they be installed. Um, the typical price for a B560 is probably $120, which is going to be better for a lot of people. So you have to wonder whether a B560 owner is actually somebody who will go out and buy a Core i9. Um, based on what the pricing we've seen, perhaps the Core i7 is going to be the better deal uh, in that context. Um, adaptive boost technology doesn't really matter if you're overclocking because you're setting your own frequency limits in that regard. And some motherboard manufacturers, even though the default should be off, might just enable it anyway because we've had this sort of feature since 2012 in multi-core enhancement. Now that's slightly different because multi-core enhancement is a fixed frequency. Um, this at least is opportunistic. But again, it's disabled by default. So the only people who are going to see it are those who enable it. And in our testing, because it's disabled by default, we're not likely going to be seeing it in any of our testing. There is a chance that come a future generations or updates down the line with this platform, Intel will decide to make it enabled by default. And if that's the case, then yeah, we'll see an uplift and people who update their biases will also see a natural uplift, you know, unless you're overclocking. Intel continues to confuse with its turbo boost technologies. Um, they're in stages and the engineer, engineer in me understands what exactly Intel is going through. So I think the marketing needs to be tighter. It needs to be better executed. And especially with these high power numbers, just listing the TDP on the box is no longer enough. Um, we're going to have to see Intel revitalize how it describes power draw and TDP, even though TDP isn't exactly power draw, but you get what I'm saying. It really needs a step up. Um, AMD, on the other hand, you've got the TDP and then you've got the um, total package power tracking envelope. And for a 105 watt CPU, that's 142 watts. And in our testing, we see 142 watts max for those 105 watt CPUs. And that's it. And they have floating turbo since Zen Plus, actually. Uh, so AMD have had it for three years. Intel's introducing it, disabled by default on Core i9. This is something that will probably make more sense further down the stack. And we might have to wait until next generation products to see it. Uh, or we might see it roll out in laptops as well. What do you think? Um, if you get one of these chips, will you be enabling adaptive boost technology? Are you be leaving it disabled to save power? Or are you going to be overclocking anyway so it doesn't matter? Leave your thoughts down below in the comments. Uh, please give a like if you like the video. You know where the subscribe button is. Uh, we also have Patreon. Many thanks to the Patreon members. You really do help the channel. And what's your minimum specification? Better turbo descriptions. Please. Please.